we're going to talk Epic, but then I got sick and then we thought we weren't and now we are again. So, um, but there's also Percy Jackson casting news. There's an interview that came out with Rick that we're probably going to want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, just general election stuff. Yeah. Yeah, let's get the bad stuff out of the way first, I think. <laughs> um, so obviously, we're both really bummed about the election and had our own different emotional responses to it that very much go with our astrology. I <laughs> immediately was like, I don't want to feel all these negative emotions. What am I supposed to do now? Tell me what to do. <laughs> and you were like, I'm going to feel everything. <laughs> I'm going to feel everything. And then come up with some sort of a plan in my head of how I'm going to like exist now. Yeah. Well, and we do have to acknowledge, like I live in a much more liberal state with a democratic governor at the moment, which means like, I don't have as much to worry about as you do. Your state voted red and yeah. You know, we have like a, we have, you know, democratic everything else. Like we have a democratic governor for a while and um where i think we're close to fixing our supreme court finally um after it being fucked up for a really long time mm -hmm. so like we we voted red but it was only by like thirty thousand people <laughs> and like that made the difference it's always like that here um but it's not even necessarily that it's more of just being worried about like having him be around at all yeah like causing that chaos all over again yeah i made a post that like i kind of wish it would have gotten a little bit more traction but it was like white women if you want to actually do something talk to your sons about the ideas that are going to proliferate pro proliferate in the next four years because i definitely had that talk with william where it was like you look a certain way and also you are a boy and so sometimes people are going to take you more seriously than they take, you know, people with different skin colors or girls or things like that more seriously. And the best thing that you can do is just be a voice for equality. And um, so we had little talks about like, because he does play certain games where we don't let him play any games where there's like voice chat, um, but he has some where there's like a written chat. And so I've told him, like, do you know how to report people if you see something you don't like or that, you know, rubs you the wrong way, that seems racist or sexist? And do you know how to block people on those sites? Um, and I did, like, even have the conversation of people might try to recruit you into ideals like that, you know, like, just because of the way you look. And um, I want you to remember, like, you are not that kind of person. You are here for equality. You're here for justice. And, yeah, like, just don't fall for it. Yeah. I guess we just wanted to acknowledge it because we're not our own asshole, like, bosses. Like, mm -hmm. we don't have to act like this isn't going on because it is. Yeah. It affects, like, literally everyone that we care about. <laughs> bring like Percy Jackson stuff into it one of my favorite things to compare Luke to is Trump <laughs> because um the the article that like we talked about that um that the actor who plays Luke did he taught like I told her when I read it like I'm getting like scary flashbacks to like my dad when he the way he put it was like he's very confident in what he believes and he's not afraid of going against the herd. And I'm like, that's the kind of stuff my dad used to say and what he believed, who he believed he was. He yeah. wasn't, he was just an abusive monster. The reason why the herd was going against you was because they weren't willing to do what you were to other people. And so when, Luke, when people say that about Luke, I'm like, that's scary though, because somebody like that, <laughs> that's a scary person. And like you can take those quotes he said about Luke and take them out of context. And I'll be like, yeah, that's, that's Trump too. He's very confident. He thinks that he's in the right about everything he's doing. He doesn't care. He's just going to do what he's going to do. And he's not afraid of going against the herd. That's why people like him. Mm -hmm. And, but like to compare like Luke with that stuff, everything that Luke does is like 
colored by these like other beliefs that he had even before you know even for like you as the audience if you haven't read the books anyway know them like when he's explaining to percy why people go on quests he tells percy if you go on quests people will be afraid of you and then you can get them to do things for you without you having to do it yourself and like that and like the when he's teaching him how to fight he's being a jerk like he holds his like knife right up to like percy's neck and and like it's just being mean when he's like teaching him how like it comes off as like a sarcastic like you know teacher or whatever at the time Mm -hmm. before like the big reveal happens but he's a jerk yeah (laughs) he's being like he wants power because he wants to be able to use it to control people and he teaches Percy how to fight by like telling him how bad he, he is at it the entire time and also threatening him. And so like, even before you know who he is, that stuff comes forward. And Also, we do, we acknowledge how many people that watch this are queer, neurodivergent, chronically ill. Like, all of the, but, but by the way, we are all of those things. Exactly. <laughs> Each one of us, we're, we're, we're both queer neurodivergent and have chronic illnesses and so we're included in that which is one of those things that a lot of times your audience is like a weird reflection of of you yeah it definitely happens with us and so i that's why i say like literally everyone that i think about and everyone that i care about or interact with on a daily basis is affected by whatever is going to happen mm-hmm. in the next four years and so if you feel overwhelmed that's totally normal <laughs> Yeah, like, I would be surprised if you didn't. It's a whole, I went through this before and I know how horrible it's going to be, which is part of what makes it so horrible now that I just, I know what's going to happen and there's like nothing that I can do about it. Mm-hmm. But even if you're too young to really remember it now, um, it, you're very warranted for being upset and not wanting to deal with this and not understanding why it happened at honestly at this point i don't even i don't even necessarily care why i just want to try to figure out what i can try to do to help people i care about feel at all good yeah (laughs) including myself over over the next four years like i don't watch trump because he reminds me so much of my dad so him being president was literally hell on earth for me the first time yeah, and it's, and it's just gonna be like that again because it feels like my dad's like come back to life and he's like back in my life again and i'm like aren't i supposed to get away from you at some point you've been dead for 10 years when are you actually going to leave yeah <laughs> it's yeah a lot of craziness is gonna go down and it's scary it really is um and i am not looking forward to hearing more of his psycho babble um but we're gonna stick with what we're, we've been doing mm-hmm. we're gonna try to be a distraction when we can um i mean we're not gonna ignore issues of course but like um I mean, one thing that we can stand proud in is book talk was spreading around some list of banned books um i know you said it went offline after a while but like percy jackson was on there oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah i can tell this like full story so Project 2025 has a like a banned book list of this a uh, wild amount of books, of course, that they want to ban from libraries. They've like started doing that with like that moms for whatever group that especially in Florida just like runs amok and especially there. But um, people after the election, like the morning on like Wednesday or thir- one of the days of the last week. Uh, <laughs> A Percy Jackson account on here went on the Project 2025 website and looked at the banned book list and Rick Riordan books, Percy Jackson books are all on there. Mm-hmm. And then like literally like two hours later, the Project 2025 website made it where you couldn't look at it anymore unless you had a password <laughs> because they must have been getting like millions and millions and millions of, of people like us looking to see like specifically what their plan is now that we know that it's about they're going to actually try to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was just so funny how they tried to like take it down and like we saw it already, dudes, <laughs> and it was just really... The thing that was funny about that is some crazy person got on Twitter and was like, Percy Jackson would vote for Trump. (laughs) 
the fandom went wild and like the internet was in the in the tweet like went viral because so many people were like are you high right now like is that's the only way like percy jackson who like in episode three of the tv show or like a hundred or so pages or whatever into the first book he gets fed up with the gods for trying to manipulate him and so he sends them medusa's head on purpose because he's sick of them already he's 12. he's known about the gods at that point for like three weeks max and he's already like i'm sick of you playing these manipulation games with me so i'm gonna send this to you to, to show you that i don't want to listen to you and you think that that kid is going to be who grew up poor in New York City, who had to go to very diverse schools and like grew up in an abusive home is going with Sally. Sally Jackson as his mother is going to be like, yeah, I'm going to vote for Trump. He Like his body would explode <laughs> before he would even think about that. It's just the video I saw about it was so funny because she's like, it doesn't even matter if you guys ban the books because you're not reading them right now anyway. <laughs> yeah, Percy would never. No. And Zeus and stuff would really like him. And they would be they would be fine with they would be fine with that. They probably would think he's like exciting to watch. Um Aries would love him. Oh my god, Aries would be his biggest fan. He could be an Aries kid. Probably. <laughs> if you really want to make him like that. But no, like, it's just funny for to see that because I'm like, this is like the one character ever that his characterization is so set against any of that that it, you can't do anything to make that actually make sense besides that you just, I don't know. You just like want him to be if you if you if you like Trump or the other or you're just trying to like see how angry people can get at you. <laughs> yeah. But either way, that was entertaining just because of how the responses to it were just people like like writing out the lines from all of the books and and just that's the only response you need. It's like what else do I have to say but this? <laughs> yeah, it's all right there. <laughs> All right, so on to happier news. D23 Brazil just happened, which means we got a huge casting announcement. We have our Athena. I don't remember her name right now. <laughs> Adra. Is Andra Day? Yeah. And I recognized her name and her face, and so I Googled her. And she won an Oscar when she played Billie Holiday. And... Okay a biopic about her a couple years ago, which is probably where I remembered her from. She's more known as like a musician necessarily than a singer, but whatever, who cares? Um, <laughs> that's exciting though. And it made me feel like smart <laughs> because when they posted that, I remembered how I looked it up. It was like October 10th and 11th. Becky Riordan was posting pictures of spiders on her Instagram. And I was looking at those and I'm like, is Athena gonna be in this season of the show? <laughs> and because the spiders can only meet, and she even mentioned Annabeth in mm -hmm. the caption, she was like, here's the pictures of Annabeth's like bestest friends. And I was like, what are you doing, Becky? Like, you're like, you're like Annabeth. So you're, you're never, you're smart in these like little things that you give towards people. And I'm like, am I being weird by like reading into this? She could just be take, taking pictures of nature. <laughs> and then like a month later, I'm like, never mind. Yeah, I was she was doing something. <laughs> she was doing something. <laughs> and like, I don't know if anyone else but me was like, why are you showing us pictures of spiders right now? <laughs> yeah, you've gotten very good at her little hints. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I think our like intelligence works similar ways in the way that we do like little hints that mm -hmm. if you aren't maybe in your, my brain, it doesn't make sense. Because I just like pick up on them and I'm like, I know what you're doing, ma'am. I appreciate it. Keep doing that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the one thing from that that I will say is that the picture that they posted of Leah with her on set mm -hmm. he was wearing the same clothes that she was wearing in that one crazy scene that nobody saw but like Luke and Sally and everyone was all in that scene and we had nobody had any idea what the hell was going on mm -hmm. and so 
Uh, that I know some people thought maybe that was them doing like the siren scene, mm -hmm. and that could be possible. But the thing I also wondered was like, well, they were just filming scenes for the last, you know, the one of the last episodes anyway, when they would be on like Polythemus's island, and they obviously had to film that stuff outside early since they're filming in Canada. And I was like, they could have just been filming that scene outside for one of the last, for like when they come back afterwards yeah. too. And they've just been, if they were filming the Polythemus scenes early, they could have just been filming the, that scene and whatever other scenes we don't even know about like that early too. And it is fun to imagine Athena being there, <laughs> especially if they let Poseidon and Athena be in the same place because of how much they hate each other, that that would be really interesting because, I mean, we just read the first three books and the only time I can remember the two of them being in the same room together is during the big council scene where all of the gods are there though. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really get any interactions between them at all. And so it would be really fun if the TV show lets them interact in any way uh because they hate each other so much <laughs> and it would just yeah. be really interesting yeah it would be an interesting thing to do and i they're not against writing in scenes with the gods that aren't in the books we had it with hermes and hephaestus in um the first season so it's possible yeah and and it's also interesting because of how nicely they adapted medusa in season one that that whole story makes both of them look like garbage at the same time and then athena looks even more like garbage in the next episode when she doesn't help them at the arch but just medusa alone just like puts this idea in percy and annabeth's heads that their parents kind of suck mm -hmm. and so it'd be really interesting to see if they were around them at all how they would respond at this point um like we know how Percy would respond. He just asked his dad about his mom. Yeah. <laughs> like one one scene from the second episode when he's like praying to Sally is he says like, I don't care if my dad ignores me, but he's I'm never gonna let him get away with ignoring you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's all that child cares about is if he's nice to his mommy. Um, he doesn't care if his dad ignores him. He's like, whatever, that's the same as how it is right now. But don't be don't make my mom be sad. <laughs> um, but for Annabeth, it'd be really interesting because I don't know that we we barely ever see interactions between her and Athena in the books, really. We more hear about them later on, but we don't really get to see too much of them. Like she definitely panics at the end of Titan's Curse when she's like, Oh my god, my mom is talking to Percy, like what is she saying? <laughs> Yeah, and Athena, like, backs out of the conversation. She doesn't even really say anything to Annabeth in that scene, so... I mean, they could have been talking at that party that, you know, Percy didn't notice because everybody else was coming up to him, but... Yeah. Um, she did, like, back out of the conversation as soon as Annabeth approached, so... Yeah, we don't get to see it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, what else did they say at that thing? Oh, Walker said that his favorite scene to film was when they go into the sea of monsters with um the sea monsters and that charybdis yeah and he's the way he said it was like that that is like huge you guys are going to be so excited and i remember when we read sea of monsters we were like this scene is going to be like gigantic because of how many things are happening at the same time like the ship is almost exploding and then it does explode tyson we think dies they think everyone dies and but it's more the thing is they're trying to get through the big mouth one while at the same time the other one is like grabbing them in the middle of the air and so there's just so many so many things happening at the same time and then it ends with him being like flung a hundred feet into the air and just like crashing and like passing out where like annabeth has to like find two dr peppers and a ship with like a tiny little sail on it that's not like broken it apart in half and drag him onto it to get to even have them be able to like leave and keep going and so it is like a that will be a ginormous scene and it's like kind of overwhelming to imagine how much planning it would take to film something like that jesus christ 
<laughs> yeah, I'm going to guess that Walker had to do a stunt or two because the way that he was so excited about it, like that kid loves doing stunts and he loves special effects and he loves like camera work. So yeah. it's good. And like everyone probably would, like Leah probably had some, even, um, even now I can't remember his name. Daniel? Uh, yeah, Daniel probably did too because they had to do something with Tyson seeming to be blown up. And then Dior probably got to do some as well since it looks like she gets blown up on the ship. Um, yeah, <laughs> there everyone gets to do something wild, especially because Dior's character is the one that's trying to like pilot the ship yeah. while that's all going on. And Percy and Annabeth are like, what are you doing? Can we just get out of here? And she's like, no. <laughs> Like, no, I want to take on Charybdis. Like, this seems like a bad idea, but okay, we're just stuck here, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, let's see. And then the other thing was the article where Rick said basically, like, everything we've been guessing is what that said is like for those kids. Mm -hmm. um, so he was talking about how, like, child actors normally like it's not a good time we see what happens to child actors when they grow up especially from our generations and um he didn't want that for them he wanted them to still be able to be kids um like they are very professional and mature and he says that but at the same time like they're very protected on set mm -hmm. i was like thank god <laughs> and he he specifically said like he wants them to be able to still be like kids even though they're in a very like kind of more adult atmosphere yeah and that's what i wanted this set to be like and they gave every like everything that they ever had shown or they've ever talked about gave that idea like just the fact that all the actors were so excited and wanting to go back where they were like anxious about how long it was taking them to do season two Mm -hmm. um, that's always a really good sign when they want to go back to work that badly. Yeah. A good sign when they want to go back to work that badly. Yeah. Uh, and things like that. But it's still very nice to see them say that because that's just one of those things. Like, <sighs> this is like the first TV show or anything that has kids in it that I've actually watched in since I probably was a kid because mm -hmm. I every time I watch child actors, all I can usually think about is like, what is happening to you right now? Um, on set? Are you okay? Like, does anybody care if you're okay? Because I know that usually Hollywood doesn't care. And so I've never watched like I've never watched the Chronicles of Narnia movies. I never actually read those books somehow either. Um, I remember trying to read them and thinking that they were boring. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. 10 year old 11 year old me didn't think they were interesting. But like, I've never watched those movies. I've never watched Stranger Things, and I'm sure there's other shows with kids on them. Even like the new Avatar show, I just, I, this thing is something that I loved enough to like watch it, even though there were kids involved. And the whole time I was watching it, I was just like, please God, like let these children be okay. Um, and then when the, the, when I watched like the behind the scenes documentary, I was like, I think these kids actually are okay. That's like, amazing <laughs> yeah. and that's what actually made me start watching like interviews with them and get more into the show itself was because i wanted to reassure myself that rick riordan was the person i thought he was and would like keep these kids safe and i was like oh thank god these kids are are like kids and are like stealing all these things from set and things like that that kids would never just like admit to doing in the middle of an interview where like Rick Riordan is sitting behind them laughing about all the things that they stole from set. Like the 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 interview I watched where Walker is like being saying like, I think they just got sick of me saying that I was gonna steal the actual sword, not like the prop one mm -hmm. of like his of Riptide that they just let me take it because and he's like, I can just picture them having a meeting about me and just deciding just give the kid this sword so that he won't just steal it <laughs> and like rick is just sitting behind him with like the exec like the showrunners just they're just laughing <laughs> like listening to that and i'm like okay this is like an actual good environment thank like the good lord almighty <laughs> yes. but it, it, i i i hope it's one of those situations like so, this happens sometimes with 
Hollywood kids is that sometimes like the 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 child actors that are safer from the things that can happen to them their parents are seen as like a problem or an mm-hmm. issue or problematic in some way or not like cool or whatever and then usually when people get older and they look back at it they're like oh that person was actually in the right the entire time and so i'm hoping that this show will be something like that where like people at disney are probably thinking that like rick and becky are like over dramatic gen x weirdos for being so protective of their kids or like having that priority about them and probably thinking that they're going like too overboard the kids themselves might even think that they might think that they don't need to be protected this much but it's one of those things that a couple years from now even just talking to their peers like they talk to the kids from avatar the last airbender (laughs) just talking to those kids might make it might help them understand like why they go through these sort of things because like another thing i've seen recently of of Becky Riordan is her saying that um, when they started doing when they started doing like conventions and things like that that and when they go when they went back to season two for filming that they went to Disney and were like you need to have so much security around these kids especially Walker like so much security around this child because they were afraid that something would happen to him when he would go to like events where there would be a lot of people around and like there would be higher probability of something happening to them there or like on set if somebody broke into set or something and it was just nice to imagine like becky and rick harassing disney (laughs) like you need to protect our star or else we will kill you (laughs) that is how i imagine because if you if i just like picture the kind of emails that rick wrote the producer for the horrible movies, it would be like that. Like, if anything happens to Walker Scobell, I will find you and I will kill you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, he has such deep affection for these kids. He's talked about how they're his, like, headcanon trio now. Uh, mm-hmm. He dedicated the newest book to them. Like, he just loves them so much. It's very sweet. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um... <laughs> Let's see, was there anything else that came out of D23? I don't think so. Oh, Aryan had like his, we haven't really gotten to that point yet and do it now. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, I think they might even be called pan pipes, but um, so like that, like I think of uh, Peter Pan, like playing mm-hmm. it, yeah. And I guess the last thing I'll say is I saw somebody make a comment today about how people were trying to say that they don't like Athena because of the clothes she was wearing. And just a reminder to like talk about what we were just talking about with the election, white people will make up excuses in their minds. And I can say this as a white person, you got, you know, we do this. We will make up excuses in our minds to come up with a reason for why we don't like something when it's just racism. Yeah. If you don't like Andra, as athena and you're like oh it's just because she's wearing different clothes no you're just being racist you have racist ideas that athena can't be black and so you're just trying to find something wrong with what she looks like because there's literally nothing for you to base it on besides how she stands next to leah (laughs) that's the only thing you have right now and so like if you're if you are immediately thinking that she's not going to do a good job that's the only reason you could be judging her for because she's won an Oscar. Like, are you really going to try to say that she's not good enough acting? Yeah, are you well, sure you want to say that? <laughs> I don't think what she was wearing in the siren scene was even described. So, like, <laughs> that's up to debate. And then the first time Percy sees her, she's dressed as, like, a tour guide in the Hoover Dam. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the first time. And then in the Hoover Dam, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the first time. And then I don't remember what she was wearing on Olympus. She might have gone traditional at Olympus, but um, yeah, we, so we don't really have something to be like, that's not the outfit she was wearing. It's like, shut up. Yeah. It's a TV show. She looks great. And, and if the only scene she's in is like the flashback, whatever, like the, not flashback, but like the siren scene where it's just 
like a mirage version of her. It doesn't matter if it's accurate to her because it's an Athena that doesn't actually exist. That's an Athena that's nice. <laughs> like, that's not real Athena, so who cares if her clothes look different? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's Athena in Annabeth's head. Yeah, that's an Athena that would, like, get along with her dad. And also Luke wouldn't like try to stab them all to death. And so that's like not real reality. So nobody in that scene is actually supposed to look how they actually are because it's not how they are. So can you maybe pick something else? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And their faces, when I saw them together, I could see like how they could look like mother and daughter. They do a weirdly good job of, uh, of, casting people that look similar enough where who are supposed to be related in some way that it's not hard like the young the little kid um who played little percy his first name is asriel he looks freakishly similar <laughs> to walker scobell when he was the same age he was it's weird <laughs> when people <laughs> post pictures of them that he like that his parents will repost on like his Instagram. I'm like, this is this is kind of weird and creepy <laughs> that you guys look so similar. Oh my God, that's wild. And so not only with them, but like Daniel looks similar enough to Walker to make it make sense, even though they don't have the same mom, who the fuck cares? Mm -hmm. But it but it's enough and it's the same thing with Leah and her that they look similar enough that that you can it's very easy to see how they are related and on a on a show where you have to like see it that stuff matters more even with um tomorrow who plays uh who plays Stalin, oh, yeah. and look uh, like at least looking similar enough to um lance reddick even though we don't know who's going to play zeus going forward it's likely going to be another black person since tamara is his daughter yeah and that and that's the best way to make everything look cohesive on a show like this when especially when the cast gets bigger and bigger as the seasons go along you want to make it easy for the audience to follow along with who everybody is yeah my guess with that too is they're probably gonna avoid because they can avoid zeus scenes until the third book so like they're probably going to yeah and even with zeus in the third book he only has the scenes at the very end Mm -hmm. And so whoever it is, like, wouldn't need to be fully cast until the very end of that season. So they have a lot of time to figure that stuff out. Because they all actually knew Lance Reddick, obviously. So it's going to be hard for them to, to recast somebody else in this role of somebody that they knew and miss and, and all that kind of stuff. So they have, like, a long time before they have to really do that. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, so we could talk a little bit about Epic. This is going to be a shorter one because like I'm still feeling sick, but like we did watch the Troy saga part mm -hmm. and um, I have to say so far, I like the adaptation. Um, my thing about um, Greek mythology and reading source material is that a lot of times duty is so emphasized. It's hard to see like the emotions of the character. And um, so the first kind of animated is a combo of two songs. It's um, The Horse and the Infant and Just a Man. And it kind of goes from them sacking Troy um, and they put to, um, they put Astyanax's death like immediately during the sack of Troy, um, which um, the version that I'm the most familiar with is the Trojan Women by Euripides. And in that one, Odysseus isn't the one who directly throws him off of the walls. He's just the one who says we have to do this because he's going to grow up one day and want to get vengeance for his kingdom. Um, and so I don't know that he was necessarily the person who did it in that version. There are a mixture of like reports on what happened because of course oral history gets like really um, crazy where a lot of times it's actually Achilles son, Neoptolemus. Mm -hmm. um, and like sometimes like I found that there's one version that isn't even in existence anymore. Like we don't have it. That is the version where Odysseus is the person who does it directly. Um, but 
either way, he he had a hand in it. And that's always something that's been hard for me to reconcile as a fan of Odysseus, because he is one of the more interesting heroes in like any Greek epic to me. Um, he's one of the more three-dimensional ones. And so thinking too, like he he like had his infant son as his reason that he didn't want to go to war. It really was a big part of his his like saga of joining the war. He pretended to be insane so that he wouldn't have to go. He yoked his plow with like an <laughs> oxen and a donkey or something like that, two different animals so that like it didn't drive straight. And he was, um, I think he was sowing like sand or something like that, I forget, but he was not doing something that made sense on his plow. And um, so to trick him to show he wasn't insane, somebody's like, let's put baby Telemachus in front of his plow. And if he stops, obviously he's in his right mind. Obviously he's in his right mind. Um, and he stopped, of course. So mm -hmm. that's how it was like, okay, you have to go, dude. Um, and I love that that first one really plays on that ideal of like, this is the same age I left my own son at. Um, seeing him not happy with the fact that this has, has to happen. They kind of had Zeus be the person like telling him, you know, you got to do this because he's going to grow up and he's going to do terrible things. Um, and it was an interesting play on it. Um, I do love that, like the characterization of Odysseus there was like, I really don't want to do this, like, but it's duty. Mm -hmm. I, and especially if you're going to do a musical about the Odyssey, it has to be all about Odysseus and like his character mm -hmm. and who he is as a person, like what he's, the ethics and like values he has in the beginning and how much he has to renege on some of that stuff to just like survive in order to get home through all the all the years of the odyssey and um and it, you do kind of have to have like a starting point like when you have like a character going through that sort of story you have to have like a starting point of who they actually are before all this bad stuff happens to them that like changes them somehow yeah. And so I thought that showing him literally like begging in the song, like, please don't, I please don't make me do this. I don't want to kill the baby. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but looking at it and being like, I know I'm supposed to kill the baby because the baby might grow up and try to murder me one day. But I really, why are you making me kill this baby? And, and also just like the whole, we talked about this a little bit before we started filming this today, but the whole thing of like the gods asking you to do things that you really don't want to do but you feel like but in these sort of stories people feel like they have to do them yeah because the gods are asking them to that it's always fun to compare this stuff to percy jackson because percy tells the gods no 40 billion times and they literally have to get down on their knees and like beg him sometimes to get him to do anything if you're apollo and trials of apollo he literally basically closes the door in your face and tells you to get the fuck out and and things like that so it's like he doesn't have any respect for them necessarily in that way like if the gods are asking him to do something that he really doesn't want to do he goes through a whole thing of figuring out if he really should do it like with the prophecy and everything it takes him many years before he gets to the point where he's like okay i'm just gonna do this um, but he, but it, you see him going through that whole process of deciding where odysseus is just like well the gods said I have to kill this baby, so I guess I'm just going to kill the baby. Yeah, Ashley is saying the gods of Percy Jackson are bound to will of demigods carrying out actions the gods are barred from, which gives the demigods power. Mm -hmm. um, and I I mean, somewhat like the gods are of the um, the Iliad, which I, I mean, it's you can't place the, the first song of epic in the Iliad because they didn't get to the sacking of Troy in the Iliad. But at least in the Iliad, we see um, like the gods directly intervening. They go onto the battlefield and stuff. Let's see. Epic relies on the idea the gods are able to impose will and make life harder because they think it's fun. Um, and I mean that's that's somewhat true in Percy Jackson too. But mm -hmm. you're right in that like 
the demigods can just say no. They can just like not do it. Their life is going to be miserable if they don't do it though, which like, you know, the gods do have the power to make things more miserable at least. Um, well, I, that's why this is one of those things why I love Percy Jackson is that the demigods in all of these stories always had the option to say no. They just like felt like they didn't, but with a story that's written by Rick Riordan, he's trying to point that out by being like, no, these demigod people always had, they have a lot of power actually in that role. You as the like abused one, you actually have a lot of power to <laughs> tell the other person who's controlling you no, and to like use them, you can manipulate them right back sometimes. And usually with stories, was like a whole like elitist classism thing, but usually in a lot of the adaptations of the Greek mythology stories, they like want you to like the gods or at least they present them as like nice, nicer people. Mm -hmm. And so they don't bring up the fact that like, actually these people, they're asking them to do things, making them do these things they don't want to do. Those people could just tell them no, and that would immediately make them look like a bad person. And if you want to believe that the gods are like more like these fun, like almost like overly hormonal teenagers that never grow up, then you don't want to see them that way. Um, but that's always there. And that, I think that's why you, it, you can see it in like Epic too. Like Odysseus could have just told Zeus, I'm not going to kill this fucking baby. You do it <laughs> if you think it's that important for this baby to die. But he was just like conditioned at that point that if the gods ask you to say, yeah, if they ask you to do something, you have to do it. Yeah. And it's like, you don't actually, though, you can tell them no. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard because this one's like much more classical in its, in its treatment of that, where like, you have to imagine there would be consequences for going against the gods, at least a little bit. And the consequences don't seem as dire in Percy Jackson for going against the gods. Um, and um, I don't know, though, like the whole humanistic part of it, because I have to wonder as, you know, a person with high empathy, if like there were people during wartime, during a lot of these ancient battles where you did, did have to do hand to hand combat, and sometimes you were fighting boys who were barely old enough to hold up their spear and sword, you know? Like, sometimes you did have to go through and sack cities and pull out women and children. Like, how many of them actually were like, this is fucking awful, I don't want to do this, you know? I don't think they think about that a lot. A lot of them do, because that's just what people, that's what happens to people. Yeah. Like, no, no person can sit there doing horrible things and seeing especially if you literally like see it like if you see how they're hurt how you're hurting innocent people you can't sit there and watch it like that's why you know the worst stuff that like people think of that humanity has done is mainly when maniacal dictators come up with ways to do horrible things to people in mass numbers that where the people where their fighters don't have to directly do it to them anymore because mm -hmm. their fighters can't handle doing that and they and so that they are like instead of being like maybe we should stop they're like what if we find some way of doing this where they don't have to directly do it anymore so that our fighters stop like having so much ptsd that they can't fight anymore and yeah. so like absolutely there are people back then that were feeling that way too it's just that the in the stories you can't like kind of memorialize these battles and make them sound like these amazing fantastical events if you talk about those people's perspective <laughs> because that immediately like makes all the it's like that whole um i forget what disney movie it is where all of a sudden they're like Good feelings gone, <laughs> and that's like exactly what would happen. Was it Mulan? I I can't, I'm gonna find the clip and put it it's in. It's like girl worth fighting for, and then they come to that village that's like completely mm -hmm. ransacked, and it's like never mind. Okay, no, and so that that's it's just like the perspective of what is usually shown. That's why I love a lot of the Greek mythology retellings that people have been doing the last however many years especially 
-hmm. because they're ones that that usually I think it's really funny because a lot of like classes people like classes like professors and stuff that I see sometimes don't like these things because they show the gods as being jerks mm -hmm. and they don't show the heroes as like these amazing stoic figures instead they show them as who they really were or like the destruction that the gods actually would do if they made those sort of choices and I feel like that's what you should be showing <laughs> if you're going to keep retelling these sort of stories because that's the stuff that's way more like accurate to what most people go through in life uh than like the god's perspective like nobody wants to like humanize necessarily the like all, all powerful beings like making people do things that they don't want to do <laughs> yeah. that just that don't have to deal with any of the consequences and just like keep having parties and getting drunk and while they just like play with humans lives for fun because they think it's entertaining and so i really liked how this this is also going in line with that of like showing odysseus as a very because like you can't do something about the odyssey and then set up odysseus as like a really nice like hero guy a really nice person who like just wants to go home to his wife and his kid and it's like a really nice guy and like through like the first few songs like he starts like having a hard time with everything that they're doing and his i don't even know who his friend was in that one song um but his friend is like trying to make him be more optimistic and don't give up and don't like don't be like sad all the time things are gonna work out everything's gonna be like you don't tell the story of odysseus and and set him up as like the hero not expecting for people to get really fucking angry at the gods yeah <laughs> because of how horrible they are to him yeah um i mean everything he goes through is shitty and only really athena cares about him so it just is how it is yeah yeah um let's see so that was the first song. I mean, the only other thing I want to say about that, and I know I told you this story. I don't know if I've told it on this podcast. Um, I had to read the Iliad multiple times in um, in college, along with the Odyssey, in both English and, like, I didn't translate the Iliad, but I had to know the first few lines in Greek at one point. Um, and with the Iliad, at one point we were reading it while I was pregnant. The class was called like Love and Eros in Ancient Literature or something like that. Um, and William loved that class in utero. That was like his most active time. Um, Hermes helps for the plot and the tea. That's what Ashley said, yes. Um, yeah, so um, I had to read the Iliad while pregnant, and I remember specifically during that class, the teacher called out this scene in the Iliad where Hector comes and he checks on all of his women. He checks on his mom, he checks on um, Andromache, his wife, and he's still like fully suited up. He has his armor on, he has his helmet on, and when Astyanax sees him, he starts crying. And so Hector just like giggles and takes it off. And he's like, look, it's me, it's dad. Um, and in that part, they're talking about how Astyanax is doomed, how like the whole family is doomed, even though they're having this beautiful moment right there. And pregnant 21 year old me was just like in tears. And I wrote Jake a whole letter. I wonder if he still has it because he keeps almost everything I write for him. Um, I wrote this whole letter of how like, could we name our son as Dianax? <laughs> like, I didn't know William was a boy yet. But I was like, if we have son, can we name him as Dianax? Because um, poor Dianax got thrown off the walls of Troy and he didn't deserve it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just laughing because first off, the best thing you like wrote that out in a letter is so like, like just you, like old school and like a, like 21 year old you is of course like writing letters to <laughs> when most people don't do that kind of stuff anymore anyway. And especially when you're 21. And But then I'm like imagining it because just from what I know of Jake, I'm just imagining like, like Libra Jake coming home and like reading this letter from you being like, I want to name our baby this like weird Greek name and him being like, how do I tell her no without making her sad? 
Well, that's the thing is he just makes it everything a joke. Like, and so he was like, yeah, no, nobody's going to know how to say that or spell that. <laughs> like, yeah. That, honestly, when um, I have a, a year and a half old niece and my sister and her partner took the really long time before they decided on a name, it wasn't until Lexi was like, I don't know, she was probably like eight months pregnant before she really like fully like picked a name. And every time we would see each other, we would end up talking about different names and stuff. And every time we would talk about it, all three of us would be like, how would kids bully her for this name? because we all were bullied at school. And so we were trying to think of something that doesn't have something in it that would inherently make it easier for kids to make fun of her just based on her name alone. Yeah. <laughs> he also vetoed Hector. So uh, he's like, I don't know why Hector just feels like a kid who's going to get bullied. I feel like even though you are like half Mexican, I feel like everyone would just assume that he was Mexican with that sort of name. And then his entire life, he would have to sit there and explain like his racial makeup to everybody and yeah. be like, I am 25% and it would be like, oh my God, let's just stop this now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So William is actually named for Jake's grandpa and that was the right choice. Like, because he had five years with Jake's grandpa and like, it was a very touching moment when we told him about the name. Oh, that is yeah. really cute. Like, because he had five years with Jake's grandpa and like, it was a very touching moment when we told him about the name. Oh, that is yeah. really cute. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Um, and then the next, the next song was, um, Shoot, why? Um, is it Full Speed Ahead? I think was the yeah. name of it. Um, and that was them. They were sailing. They um, they realized they were about to be out of supplies and they need to go pillage. Um, and they they skip over. I'm pretty sure chronologically the island of the Sicones is is first. And I don't remember a lot about this. So like it really is one of those chapters that like sometimes when you're reading in a classics class, they'll have you skip because it's like not really anything. Um, and most people do skip right to the Lotus Eaters, which is the next song, Open Arms. Um, I don't have too much to say about that other than I don't necessarily understand the choice of turning the lotus eaters into those little creature things. I mean, they're <laughs> cute. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I feel like that was definitely like an artistic choice. Like the, whoever was the one who, who made the animation for that, like we watched it, but I still don't remember their username. Um, whoever like drew that out just thought like let's make them kind of weird and cute just to make this more interesting yeah the main thing i thought of just because i know fandoms is the song when they were all all the guys were singing on the boat and then that song i was like how many fan fiction has been written about these characters <laughs> like just i want to look it up almost to see it. there has to be a bunch of them just from those two songs yeah <laughs> because that's just that's what fandoms do. They always write where they always end up writing stories about like two white men hooking up. And I'm like, I know there has to be some. Just yeah. tell me which ones. Yeah, I like I am so uninvested in Odysseus's crew, to be honest, as like somebody who's read the Odyssey, because like I know they all die. Like I hate to say it. But like <laughs> it it's hard to stay invested in them. So that's like I don't memorize the names, and so every time that they, a name was brought up, I'm like, I know I've read that name, but I don't remember that person. It's like, you're all gonna die soon. I think it's best that I keep distance from you emotionally. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's not a single person on the crew that I, like, really took that much stock in besides Odysseus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so that's open arms. And then the last one was... Um, Warriors of Wisdom, right? Something like that. Yep. Warriors yeah. of the Mind. Warriors of the Mind. Yes. Because it's the Athena song, Warriors yeah. of the Mind. Um, and in that one, they kind of gave a backstory of Odysseus that Athena laid out a challenge of a boar that needed to be caught. 
and he's the one who came up with the plan like you see him planning it out in the animation and then he's the one who ends up taking it down because the plan actually doesn't work and it, it breaks free of the ropes that they had um and like i do like the idea of athena watching him since he was little because it's always just kind of like understood yeah she just favors him because of his cunning like most of the epics will leave it at that it's just like yeah he embodies everything she likes so that's why she <laughs> likes him um when you know part of you starts to wonder okay but is he like that way because she favors him or is she does she favor him because he's like that way like it could be a circular thing yeah like does he because at least the first song of this whole thing odysseus always I, this is funny but because I don't remember very much from my childhood in general, but for some reason, when I was in sixth grade and we did all of the Greek and Roman mythology stuff, I of course loved it because I was a queer neurodivergent child. So of course I loved it. Um, but I remember and when I was in school then we watched this like multi-part series about the Odyssey why do I remember so much of that movie? <laughs> like, I don't remember anything about my childhood, but I still remember watching that in on multiple days, watching this like like mini series that was probably on like the on like TV in the nineties about the Odyssey. And I remember, but I think I remember it because I really liked Odysseus and because he always kind of struck me as a very like nice good like kind person that was being like pushed to the absolute limit by like everyone and maybe that's why i always remember him because that was also my life at the time and but i don't know but either way like i could see him as somebody who would try to do things to like make her happy and that's literally like this song like the end of the song is her basically is her saying like don't let me down and he's like god damn it <laughs> like yeah. god damn it like what does that mean and he's just like that's so much pressure that you just like popped in to be like don't fail me and you're like okay um but somebody like that who just is like a nice person that wants to help everybody it would be very easy to get him i think to do things that he normally wouldn't because he knows that 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 will make Athena happy and he doesn't want to make her upset with him. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like it's more that, that like he ends up doing stuff that he normally wouldn't because and that's kind of Athena's whole thing is she likes, I think that's what she likes. Like she likes the idea of kind of molding people into being who she thinks mm -hmm. it's that whole thing of like, I see the potential in you yeah You're trying to kind of um move them into being the kind of person that she thinks they could be that would make them more like successful because she thinks that the way that she thinks they should be is like the best way and so i could see her being like that with him of like i want to make him more like tough mm -hmm. and not be crying over killing babies <laughs> and and like make him more like a hardened like soldier because he has potential for being like a really good soldier and strategizing and winning all these battles and mm -hmm. things like that. I could, I could see that being a thing. Yeah. I mean, but like to take it back to Percy Jackson stuff, we also see that sometimes a part of that is caring about your fellow soldiers mm -hmm. because that's Percy's biggest strength. We just read, you know, Titan's curse and at the end, he takes on the burden of the sky because he's like, you know what? None of us are going to be able to defeat Atlas. So I got to let Artemis, you know, jump into this battle. And um, that's just who he is. You know, he sees people for their strengths. And I would say Odysseus does too. A lot of times, like Odysseus does recognize everybody's strengths, but like sometimes it, it does feel very cold and calculated when you're reading his character in the original source material. And mm -hmm. that's that's what she likes. Um, but the Odyssey, of course, is, is the part where he gets more humanized because it's literally just about him. It ends up being just him. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but yeah, so, so far, I am down with this interpretation. I, 
I think that um, it's, there's a lot of love put into it and you can feel it. Like, and even the animations, like, felt like there was a lot of love in that too. Um, it's nice to see people adapt these things. The Odyssey is one that I feel gives a lot of people inspiration. Because aside from that TV movie that you've mentioned, there's Oh Brother Where Art Thou was inspired by the Odyssey. Um, I forgot the name of it, but it was one that had like Nicole Kidman and um, what was it? I think it's called Cold Mountain or something like that. That one was inspired by the Odyssey. Oh yeah, I remember. I'm remembering that movie. I didn't watch it, but I it won like Oscars or was nominated for them or something. I had no idea that it was based on the Odyssey, but that's not surprising. Yeah, like more loosely, of course. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou is a little bit closer, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I never saw the, the movie that you're talking about, but those were the kinds of things that my professors would show or like point to. Um, I'm thinking more my high school Latin teacher did it than anybody else. <laughs> this makes me want to see if I can somehow find that movie. Again, I don't know how, where it would be <laughs> anymore, but I can at least try to see if it still exists and if it's anywhere near as good as, as like sixth grade me thought it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, the thing I really like about this musical is that it's completely online and that like the creator of it, I don't know that much about him at all. I just like Googled it to know like what order we should listen to stuff into and i was curious and saw that he started writing it in like 2019 i think when he was in college mm -hmm. and he just like wanted to write a musical that reminded him of like the video games that he plays that he likes and he wanted it to be similar to that and so a lot of times the animation style is kind of similar to like that because they know that's what he was going for but like it's very much like a complete and total passion project that he's done like um that one girl that was mad at me about calypso she was bringing up videos that he posted on tiktok in 2022 which was like the first videos he ever posted where he was talking about writing the songs about calypso and odysseus that just came out now yeah so like that's two years of like work and planning and stuff and i don't know how long it was between 2019 and when the first like saga came out but it was recently within the, ne the last year or so i'm pretty sure and so that's a long time to be work and like we know that from doing stuff like this like it's hard to work on something and not like show it to the world when you're excited about it because you just want to like share it that's so much he put in so much work and it's just fun to yeah. see that it's all like on youtube that the artists that are doing were like inspired by it and just started doing animations from it and they're all just like normal artists it's like completely outside of any sort of corporate anything ever there's none of that and so you don't have to worry about something weird happening to it one day or it getting canceled it's just purely like if the guy who writes it gets exhausted is <laughs> yeah. like the only thing you have to wonder about but since it's a passion project he probably won't get tired of doing it until he you know finishes it and moves on to another passion project so that's how that's like when you have passion for something you can do it forever um and so it's just fun to see somebody like that get that amount of like attention and and um and all very positive attention that's just i really like that because that's what that's like the best kind of stuff that you can find is people just doing stuff like that not because they're necessarily trying to make money off of it but just because they love it and if they like somehow make money off of it they're like that's a weird accident <laughs> yep <laughs> so that was cool to see somebody so into this stuff that he just started writing and I'm just like imagining like a college student in his dorm writing like a musical about the Odyssey. <laughs> that's just such a that's just such a, a cool thing to decide to do one day. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I'm excited to watch more of it, um, especially because like this week was such crap. And honestly, if I would have gotten to it sooner, I feel like that would have looked my spirits. But <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it will be something that fun to look forward to when there isn't anything else to look forward to. Like after the D23 thing came out, I was like, there's nothing happy for me to look forward to right now that I know is actually going to happen sometime soon. So I'm going to have to make up something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need something. And uh, a new musical thing like this will be fun to just see different, slightly different interpretations of the same characters, but they're very, but they're similar enough to Percy stuff that they just remind me of why I like Greek mythology in the first place. Yeah. Uh, let's see, was there anything else we could talk about right now? Um, oh, we could talk about our whole um, merch thing. Yeah, so we're looking into merch. Um, Shannon's bought some supplies because she wants to create new artwork for it. Um, and we got the idea because Shannon had posted um, just, you know, the quote from Sally Jackson in the TV show where she is saying, um, hold fast, brave the storm. Um, that sentiment that she says is part of Perseus's lore, which actually isn't part of his lore, but I will take it because it's so cute and so sweet. Um, mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make some merch around that. Um, and also there's a part where um, it's right before she gets taken by the Minotaur, where she says, you are not broken, you are a miracle. Um, and that's another phrase that we were thinking would make a good kind of merch shirt something. Um, I, of course, because of who I am as a person, am trying to figure out the most sustainable way to do it. It's hard to find, um, what was it? Um, print on demand is like what it's called, where like we're not having an inventory, they print it as their order. Um, that's US based, that's actually at least, you know, sustainable in some way or ethical. Um, because of course the, the big things that come to my mind as somebody who's learning about the fashion industry are, are the materials sustainable or as sustainable as possible? Um, are they produced ethically and like, what is the carbon footprint of what we're making kind of things? Um, and yeah, it's. If anybody has suggestions, I'm I'm open to them because I did find some, but like I said, they're not US based, so shipping might be not fun um, <laughs> price wise. Yeah. A lot of, I mean, just the fact that when you're paying for ethical labor, it's not cheap. Um, so we're going to try to do it the best we can. We'll probably have lower tier items besides like shirts and sweatshirts too, just so it is a little bit more accessible. I'm thinking like stickers or um hats lanyards bags kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah like because of who we are as people we decided oh, yeah. to do something to do something to feel like we were doing something positive right now and yeah. because of who we are as individuals of course i'm gonna just make something mm -hmm. that will turn into something and and you'll like find a way to do it while saving the planet yeah this is, this is an aquarius run organization <laughs> i'm an aquarius sun she's an aquarius rising that's what we care the most about and of course and also like of course like this i was like laughing about this usually when people make merch attached to like another creative project they're making they just like will put like their logo on a t-shirt and we're like no we're trying to like make people feel like they belong during a time when they feel like they don't belong. That's such an Aquarius -like thing to do, which is just, that's the only thing that we're ever gonna wanna make merch out of. But the thing I wanted to make sure to say about that though, is that if you ever have any ideas, like I do this when I listen to things that I really like, I'll like be like, they should put that on a t-shirt. If you've ever thought that about anything we've ever said, <laughs> just to like tell us somewhere and we'll probably do it <laughs> yeah we don't have the self-awareness to be like i was actually really funny when i said this <laughs> sometimes i'll like write i'll like watch our clips and i'll just like laugh about what i think how we're being funny but i'm like do other people think this is funny i'm not i'm not really sure i will say though that me saying like why do you like greek mythology if you're not queer or neurodi or and neurodivergent the one comment that like killed me was 
this person who just followed me being like, you know, I was going to argue with you, but then I realized that I'm bi and I'm neurodivergent and I don't know why I like it so much. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you just proved my point. Thanks for that. <laughs> Yes. So like that one was funny to see somebody just purely stop and be like, why do I like this so much if it's not for those reasons? And I was not even thinking when I said that. So like if if something we've said where I'm not where we're not thinking makes you like laugh or something or you just like what we said, just let us know and we'll and we'll figure out a way to make it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's something to look forward to in the coming weeks, month, who knows, <laughs> whatever long it takes us. I think it's funny because it makes it sound like we're like really smart business people that we're trying to do this right around like the holiday season. But no, it's just, this is, we were sad and this made us happy and that's why we're doing it now. Yeah. It's, it's literally like we just started doing it. One of our, um, our loyal, like our loyalist fan, Isa, just like, aggressively messaged me the other day that was like, you need to do merch, you need to do it like this and just do it now. Who cares if it, if you're not huge yet, it doesn't matter, just do it now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it was literally like, I just sent it to her and we were like, okay, let's do that. It's, it's really that easy sometimes. <laughs> and so if you're aggressive enough with me, I might just do what you say. Yeah. And it is such a good sentiment right now. Just brave the storm. Remember that you are a miracle, like no matter who you are, because people are going to try to take that away from you, especially if you look a certain way or you have a certain sexual orientation or certain gender presentation. Like it's, it's going to fucking suck for a while. And um, you are not broken. Like no matter what level of shit you have in common with us, whether it's just the neurodivergent stuff or the trauma stuff or anything else, none of, nothing about us is broken that needs to be fixed. And the narrative for the next four years is going to be that that is broken and needs to be aggressively fixed in horrible ways. And I just want something to be out there to remind people that that's not true at all. Yeah. Like Sally is not lying. <laughs> She's not lying to Percy and she's not lying about anyone else in existence either. There's nothing wrong with any of us like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know we're not going to have it the worst because I mean, I'm white presenting you're white and like, I'm already married to a man. Like I, I have survivor's guilt as fuck, like from, you know, like I'm not visibly a person of color, even though I'm a person of color. I'm not visibly queer because I'm in a hetero presenting relationship. Um, but like, there's so many people that are gonna have it so bad. Like, and mm -hmm. I feel like we have to acknowledge black women especially because the fucking like, what was it? 91% that voted for Kamala and like, <laughs> and there's so many of them in this fandom, especially because of all of the black girls slash women that they've cast on the show and mm -hmm. those people need to feel like they belong even in this like fantasy sort of genre still mm -hmm. when society is always telling them that they don't belong but it's going to be even more aggressive especially imagining like that people could have elected a black woman but they chose that guy instead that's just such a horrible thing to have to just know, like, no growing up that that's who people would rather choose. And it's like, and you have to just like exist in a society that is telling you that like, it's already hard enough for people like me who has experienced any level of like sexual assault to know that that sort of a person is now in charge of everything. Yeah, even worse when you add also, just everything he says about different races and and like even like religious backgrounds and anything else that you can't things about you that you can't change mm -hmm. that like you can't cover you can't like hide somehow yeah yeah that's gonna be really not so fun yeah <sighs> that's about all i have energy for to be honest <laughs> but um we will be back next week with more epic um probably at least another five but 
if not more. Um, Cause it was, it goes by pretty quick. It's actually really fun listen. <laughs> Yeah, the animations are really cute, so it makes it even easier to keep going. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it gets a little bit darker because I'm pretty sure the next one is Polyphemus. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's probably about to get a tiny bit dark, maybe a little bit silly and then dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So we'll leave it there. But um. Yeah. If anyone needs to talk about like what's going on in the world or anything, of course we're always here for you and. We love all of you guys. Um, our YouTube channel has been having a little bit of steady growth for a while, and um, we hope we can continue to be a safe space. space blah, blah, if I can talk, safe space when things don't feel so safe right now. Mm -hmm. That's all we can ever. That's all we ever want is to make people feel like, even if nobody else understands what you're going through, that at least some strangers on the internet do. Yeah, and it make you have at least a couple hours a week where you don't have to think about that stuff and can just think about something that makes you happy instead. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to get going. Mm -hmm. All right. Good night, everybody.